Can't decide and torn between a romantic, comedy, action, or an indie film to watch for the weekend? Well, well, well. Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast is your ultimate guide to the latest movies. Join us as we dissect the latest on the blockbusters. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast. GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Richard McDonough, and there is a lot going on in the film industry at the time of recording this podcast. Movie theaters in New York City are about to reopen at 25% capacity starting March 5th. The Golden Globes happened this past Sunday, and be sure to stick around till our final segment where we will dive into the winners and losers. So there is a lot going on around the industry. Now, if only there were compelling films coming out right now. Again, I am doing my best to search out and find the best new releases coming out on a weekly basis. But the sheer number of new releases is down, which ultimately leads to a drop-off in quality. But this episode, I've decided to talk about a few family-friendly pictures targeted at younger audiences. First will be Spongebob Squarepants movie, Sponge on the Run, and I'm just in awe that Spongebob is still going strong all these years later. I remember when the first Spongebob feature-length film came out. It was the week of Thanksgiving, and I went with my neighbors to see it because that was a short Wednesday back in elementary school. My god, I'm old. But I will be taking a look at this newest Spongebob film. In addition to that, I'll be taking a look at the newest offering from Disney Animation Studios, Raya and the Last Dragon, which is a film that just appears to have beautiful animation. So we will be taking a look at that. I'll also be taking a quick look at a movie that looks kind of terrible, but that won't bog down the show. And I will also be taking a look at a film that is much more mature, and much more adult-oriented, and that is the film Crisis, which takes a look at the opioid epidemic. So if you're looking for a more mature-based content, you're going to want to stick around until our third segment, where we take a look at the film Crisis. So the first movie I wanted to talk about on this fairly family-friendly episode of the GSMC Movie Podcast is the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Sponge on the run. And before I get into the film itself, I really just want to take a moment to talk about the staying power that Spongebob has had through multiple generations at this point. I mean, I remember being a kid and Spongebob was probably the most popular child's programming there was, starting all the way back in 1999. Here we are 22 years later, and it still has such popularity that it's getting a feature-length film. And to just give you an idea of the staying power that Spongebob has had, here's a list of some other programming that Nickelodeon had back in 1999. They had Hey Arnold, The Wild Thornberries, Doug, Cat Dog, Rocco's Modern Life, and The Rugrats. Now, all those shows are long gone. Yet, here we are in 2021, and the cartoon starring the yellow kitchen sponge who lives in a pineapple under the sea is still going strong. So much so that this movie, Sponge on the Run, is the third feature-length film that Spongebob has gotten. And the release of this film is a little complex. If you are listening in Canada, this film was released in theaters August 14th of 2020. So in that international market, this film has already been available. But it is being released to U.S. audiences March 4th to coincide with CBS All Access being rebranded as Paramount+. Plus. So Paramount must be banking on the fact that there will be a lot of families signing up for Paramount+, Plus in order to view Sponge on the Run. And me personally, I'm way outside the target market for this film. But it's just nice to see a film like this being made. A nice light-hearted adventure film that the whole family can enjoy. And there are a few elements of this film that are just pretty interesting. 
For instance, the animation in this film is completely 3D CGI, with the creators deviating from their traditional 2D animation. And just seeing the different ways a 3D Spongebob interacts with his world could be pretty cool. Another aspect of this film I found rather hard to believe when I found out about it is the music is done by Hans Zimmer. And yes, the same Hans Zimmer that has been nominated for 11 Academy Awards, winning one, is the person responsible for all the original music in the Spongebob movie, Sponge on the Run. That is not a sentence I ever thought I would say. But I guess it is in keeping with his style. While I personally think of films like Gladiator, The Dark Knight, and Inception when I think of Hans Zimmer, he did do the music for a lot of child-oriented entertainment to start his career. As I mentioned earlier, the Academy Award that he has won was for The Lion King. And he's also worked on films such as Shark Tale and Madagascar. So while it is a little outrageous for me to think that Hans Zimmer is doing the original scoring to a Spongebob movie, he has dabbled in that realm before, and he's free to do whatever he wants. So good for him, and you can definitely count on the music in this film being of the highest quality. Now, if only the same thing could be said about the cast in this film. While the traditional Spongebob cast will be appearing in this film, such as Tom Kenny, who is Spongebob, as well as Gary the Snail, Bill Fangerbank, who is Patrick Starr, Roger Bumpkiss, who plays Squidward, and Clancy Brown, who plays Mr. Krabs. The other people cast in this film are really hit and miss. And on the other cast members in this film, I guess I'll start with the good, move on to the neutral, make my way to the bad, and the overall just strange choice. Starting with the good... Keanu Reeves will be in this film. And I know he's probably best known for his action movies such as Speed, The Matrix, and most recently the John Wick franchise. But this guy started out as a comedy surfer bro. So he definitely has some comedic chops and it'll be interesting to see him in a wacky world such as the Spongebob Squarepants environment. Moving on, I'd say one of the other positive cast members in this film is Snoop Dogg, who seems to be in just about everything nowadays. And it's really weird to just see Snoop Dogg in this new image he's cultivated of just being, like, the family-friendly figure who hosts game shows and has a show and a line of products with Martha Stewart, given that he started his career as a rapper for Death Row Records. And for such a long time, he cultivated this image of a semi-hardened criminal. But he's free to do what he wants, and if being the family-friendly Snoop Dogg is what he wants to do... More power to him. Moving on to other cast members, this film will also star Aquafina, who I categorize as just kind of neutral. I really just don't understand Aquafina in general. Like, she's supposed to be a comedic actor, but her delivery on everything seems so forced and wooden with no, like, hint of authenticity to it. And I understand she's found success in dramatic roles, having won a Golden Globe for her performance in 2019's The Farewell. But when it comes to comedy, I just don't find her funny. And that's not even getting into the fact her voice just sounds like you shove gravel down the garbage disposal. But she's in the movie. I have no ill will against her. I guess there is an audience that finds her funny, so best of luck to her in this one. But a cast member of the film that I just don't understand what the audience is for her, why people find her funny, is Tiffany Haddish. I don't want to be overly critical, because I just don't want to be negative on this podcast, but she is someone who I think just became famous because she had a stand-up routine that was all based around shock value, and once the initial effect of that wore off, you can see that there's not really much depth to her comedy or personality. But that's as critical as I'll be about Tiffany Haddish. I could go on, but who has time for the negativity? And one casting choice I just found interesting is Danny Trejo. And he's just an actor that I have to give props to for being able to toe the line between being in family-friendly material like this, he was also the uncle in Spy Kids, while also being to pull a complete 180 and have a career as just... Pretty much the same character who is just out for blood and violence in all his films, having played characters in films like Machete, Death Race, 
and Grindhouse, which are extremely adult-oriented movies. Yet, he is still able to appear in family-friendly movies like this one, Sponge on the Run. And if you are listening to this podcast in Canada, you already know what happens in the movie, but for those who aren't, to give a quick synopsis of the film, the story begins with Plankton trying once again to steal the Krabby Patty formula, which is that character's main motivation. In order to do this, he kidnaps Spongebob's pet, Gary the Snail, in order to have Spongebob out of the way so he can steal the formula. He gives Gary to King Poseidon, who in this film is described as the selfish ruler of the lost city of Atlantic City. A little bit on the nose, but that's alright. And he apparently uses the slime from sea snails to rejuvenate himself. So it's nice to see that children's cartoon characters are worried about anti-aging remedies. So, the plot of the film is billed as a rescue mission. And even though Spongebob is most definitely for a younger audience, it seems based on characters like King Poseidon and jokes like him living in the lost city of Atlantic City, there will definitely be some things for adults in there as well. And hopefully this movie does a lot to draw people into subscribing to Paramount+, Plus, which is debuting at a pretty strange time. Yes, less and less people are going out to movie theaters, Although restrictions are being lifted in places like New York starting May 5th, you are able to go to a movie theater at 25% capacity. But that still doesn't change that there are a ton of other streaming platforms out there. And a person's streaming service is really something that is just habit-based behavior. So how Paramount Plus and this film in general performs will be something to watch. And it is strange that a movie that has debuted in different countries Again, this movie was in theaters last August in Canada, so it's pretty weird that it's pretty much having a second debut on Paramount Plus March 4th, given that this has been available to a major market for over seven months. And again, the pandemic is responsible for that, so movie studios and distributors have to find unique solutions to the problems that have been presented. And not only do they have to be innovative in how they get the content to audiences, they really have to be innovative in the ways they monetize it. Again, they're probably expecting big things in terms of this drawing in people to subscribe to Paramount+, Plus because from the release that this film did have in international markets, it only made back 8% of its budget. The studio invested $60 million into this. And from its theatrical release, it only made back 4.8. Now, it would be unrealistic for them to expect to even make back the budget on this film. But hopefully, it can translate into less of a loss for them. Again, I said they had to be innovative with the ways they got this to audiences and how they recouped the money for it. A way they were doing that was giving Netflix the international distribution rights. So, that helps them a little bit. But with them coming out with Paramount+, Plus, they're able to cut out the middleman and make sure they're making as much of a return on investment as possible. And it is a little ironic that because they wanted this film to coincide with the launch of Paramount+, Plus, that the U.S. market is actually the last ones to have this content. So this is just another example of how the entire film industry has been thrown for a loop with COVID-19. And while all businesses and industries have had to adapt to the pandemic and new working conditions, seeing how the film industry is responding has been pretty unique given that it was a industry that was on the decline in terms of movies actually making it to theaters, at least in the U.S. I know that other countries such as Saudi Arabia are starting to build more and more movie theaters, which I think is a positive thing for them. But especially in America, unless the movie is one of those upper echelons mega blockbusters with a giant pre-sold audience, theaters have been really struggling to be filled And the film industry needed to adapt to that, whether or not the pandemic happened or not. This really just accelerated a lot of the issues that it had been dealing with. And different companies are taking different approaches to it. For instance, Disney Plus has been charging for their new releases. I know that they charge for Milan, where you could actually pay, uh, essentially, to have a ticket when that film became available. And other Companies such as Warner Brothers are doing simultaneous releases where they're still releasing their films in theaters while having it available instantly on demand via HBO Max. 
So seeing the issues that the pandemic has presented for this industry specifically and the ways that companies are reacting to it and essentially being forced into innovation is compelling to see on multiple levels given that some of these issues they were headed for anyway. And I personally am hoping that once everyone gets vaccinated, we're able to not only open up theaters at max capacity, but really just open up the world at max capacity. And hopefully that is the case. Because while I find it interesting taking a look back at the SpongeBob franchise so many years after I stopped paying attention to it, I would really like to be talking about films that are a bit more interesting and compelling than Sponge on the Run. But again, seems like a good, wholesome family movie, so definitely check it out if you have kids. I'm going to take a quick break, but coming back, we'll be taking a look at another family-oriented film, Raya and the Last Dragon. And be sure to stick around till the end of the show, where we will be diving into the Golden Globe Awards, reacting to winners, losers, and the show as a whole. So be sure to stick around. We will be right back. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden in the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. It keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip-hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further, because this is the gold standard in music podcast. GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcasting Network. I'm your host, Richard McDonough, and we just finished talking about the newest SpongeBob SquarePants movie, Sponge on the Run. We will be sticking with the family-friendly content in this segment, and be sure to stick around until our final segment, where we will be jumping into the Golden Globe Awards, which happened this past Sunday at the time of recording this podcast, and we will be reacting to the winners and the losers. So be sure to stick around until the very end. The next installment on this pretty family-friendly episode of the GSMC Movie Podcast is going to be Raya and the Last Dragon, which seems to be the latest installment of movies capitalizing on the popularity of dragons nowadays. And this is the latest offering from Disney Animated Studios, and it will be available starting March 5th on Disney Plus for those with premiere access. And it will also be making a theatrical release on the same date. So March 5th is sort of the unofficial return to the movie theater. And as of right now, the reviews for this movie are through the roof. Which is not too surprising, given that this is coming from Disney Animation Studios, which just had another one of their feature films, Soul, take home the Golden Globe for Best Animated Feature. So hopefully Raya and the Last Dragon can keep up their streak of quality films. And not only is this film looking to continue the success of Disney Animation Studios, it will be ushering in a new era for the studio, given that it will be the first release they have of this new decade. And when people think of different eras of Disney animation, they often draw the line at the decade mark. So this one will be setting the tone for the next era of Disney animation. And to give a quick synopsis of this film, it takes place on a version of Earth known as Kamundra, where humans and dragons used to live together in harmony, but the dragons sacrificed themselves to save humanity from the evil monsters known as the Droon. And this story is set 500 years after that, where the Droon have returned, and Kamundra has been divided up into a set of warring factions where different people are constantly at war with each other. But at the time where this story takes place, there is this purple mist that is going around and turning people to stone. So it is a divided world with an airborne pathogen that is causing people to lose the ones they love. Imagine that. And it appears the only way to solve these problems is for the warrior princess Raya to go out and find the last of the dragons. So it is not only the title, but it is the main premise of the film. 
So that is the main who and the what of this film. But it also appears that the theme of trust is going to play a large role in this film as well. Like I said, this is a world where there are warring factions, and the main character, Raya, doesn't believe in trusting people that are outside of her family. So not only is she going to be set on a journey to find the last dragon, her own personal hero's journey is going to be centered around her ability to trust others. So it will be compelling to see her face those challenges and go through those changes. To give a quick rundown of the cast, this film does feature people that are mainly from Asian descent, so that's pretty cool. And another step towards having fair representation and diversity in film. But back to the main cast, we have Kelly Marie Tran in the lead role of Raya. She is probably best known for her supporting role in Star Wars The Last Jedi, as well as its sequel, The Rise of Skywalker. So it's good to see Disney brought her back for another go, for another film. Playing the role of Sisu is Aquafina, and I've already given my thoughts on her, so I'm not going to go too far into it. All I'll say is it's a good year for her in terms of child entertainment. Also part of the cast is Gemma Chin, who plays Naimari who is described as Raya's enemy, and most people will know Gemma Chin from her role in the Marvel Cinematic Universe film Captain Marvel, and she is also slated to be in the upcoming Marvel Cinematic Universe movie The Eternals. So Disney definitely gets a bang for their buck when it comes to their contracts. In the role of Raya's father is Daniel Day Kim, who most people will know from his time spent on the hit show Lost, where he played Jin. Sandra Oh is also a part of this film, where she plays Virana, the chiefess of the Fanglan. And rounding out the main cast is Benedict Wong, who plays the character Tong. And for those who don't know, he is also a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where he plays Wong as a part of the Doctor Strange movie franchise. So, uh, another example of Disney using their actors for multiple projects. Now, if only they could get a little more creative with the names of Benedict Wong's characters. But, aside from his character, everything else in this movie has a very interesting name, and they're fairly difficult to pronounce, so I will not be embarrassing myself by trying to pronounce things over and over again in this podcast. I'll just keep to the ones I know. Thankfully, Raya is easy enough to pronounce, which I am thankful for, given that it is fairly difficult to discuss a film if you cannot pronounce the name of the main character. And the main character, Raya, seems pretty compelling. I mean, I'm way outside the... Personally, I am way beyond my years of watching Disney movies, so I'm not really sure what they've been like since I was a kid, but when I was growing up, it was very much the quintessential Disney princess. Like Belle from Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, Snow White... And to be fair, I guess they did depart from that model a little bit with the movie Mulan, which also featured a warrior princess with a talking dragon friend. So, it's not stealing if you do it from yourself. But that slight recycling of characters aside, it is cool to see Disney take chances on their princess characters and present them in different lights. This character isn't going to be one of those princesses that is shut away in a tower and needs to be rescued. She is, for lack of a better term, a badass. She is going to be the one leading the charge in this film, and she's going to be the one driving the narrative. And again, I've not been really up to date with everything that Disney Animation has been doing over the past 20 years. I feel like Cars is where I checked out of Disney Animation. I did see Toy Story 3 for nostalgia purposes, but other than that... I'm definitely outside of their target demographic, but with films I've seen through, like, pop culture references, like Frozen, it seems like they're getting back to the traditional Disney princess archetype, and I just think it's cool that there's a film where they have a character that is a warrior princess. And I was thinking of spending a little time going through the other Disney princesses there have been, and come up with some list of ranking them from best to worst, but I would find it rather hard looking at myself in the mirror if I knowingly spent time of my day ranking Disney princesses. So all I will say on that subject is in terms of which ones are good female role models and which ones aren't. Absolute worst Disney princess in terms of being a female role model, Sleeping Beauty. She's lazy, she's shallow, and she has the least compelling problem to overcome. 
Oh no, I have to spend my time asleep. If only we were all so lucky. <sighs> Alright, so I got that off my chest, and that'll be all I say about the other Disney princesses right now. And this latest addition to the Disney princess lineup is way more compelling than the ones I grew up with as a kid. From a storytelling standpoint, I'll take a character that gets into sword fights over character like Snow White, who's pretty much a glorified maid. And I give credit to Disney for adapting their characters to modern times. Now, I do have to mention the fact that Snow White came out in 1937 and was based on a fairy tale much older than that. So to be fair, the societal expectations for women were a tad different than they are now. But I think it's good to have a strong female archetype in addition to having one that is of a different ethnicity than they have been in the past. And that is something I do have to give Disney credit for. They've been doing that for a couple decades now with characters like Jasmine, Pocahontas, Mulan, who I referenced earlier because she does share a lot of similarities with the character in this film. And again, this animated tribute to feminism and diversity will be available March 5th to those of you with Disney Plus Premium Access, and it will be available in select theaters. And all joking aside, this seems to be like a pretty quality film. Again, I'm not in the target age range for this film. I don't have kids, so it's not exactly up my alley. But from the mostly great cast I mentioned earlier to the directors, of which there are two of them on this film, one is Don Hall, who has been at Disney for many years, and his other directing credits for them have been Big Hero 6 and Manoa, so he has a pretty proven track record with Disney Animation. And the other director is Carlos Lopez Estrada, who is relatively young, only 32 years old, but he was part of the brain power behind Frozen 2, and he was the director of the critically acclaimed movie Blind Spotting, which deals with much more mature content than this Disney movie. So it has a pretty proven directing tandem leading the way on this one. And again, the critical response to the movie so far has been really positive. Again, I'm not a person who lives and dies by Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm not really sure of another rating site out there that collects critical responses before a movie is released to the public. So, have to gauge it by something. And Ryan the Last Dragon has a 98% positive rating on Rotten Tomatoes, with the average critic giving it a 7.8 out of 10. And again, this movie is targeted at the younger demographics, so no one is expecting it to get into Citizen Kane levels of profundity. But again, if the main theme of this film is trust and finding common ground with people that are different than you, then I think that's a pretty good message to be passed on to the kids that'll be watching it. And if nothing else, one thing you can always count on from Disney Animation is the just pure visuals of the movie. And just from the trailer, there are some amazing visuals in this film. And just to speak a moment on the level of detail in animated films with these wide sweeping shots where if it was an ordinary film it would just be part of the landscape that's already there but this is something that every single detail has to be created someone has to design it someone has to animate it somebody has to add the color to it and just the pure level of detail that goes into animated films like this is amazing and I know technology has made this a bit easier, but still. The fact that it is someone's job to be responsible for the amount of algae on a rock, or the number of water drops that fall off a tree, it is just absolutely amazing the level of detail that is put into these films, and just props to the animation department that puts in the time and are so entrenched in every little detail of a film like this. So... Even if you don't have kids and are just a fan of good animation, be sure to check out Raya and the Last Dragon. And to give another quick rundown of the cast, it stars Kelly Marie Tran, Aquafina, ugh, Gemma Chan, Daniel Day Kim, Sandra Oh, Benedict Wong, and one omission I left out earlier is Alan Tudyk, who plays Tuk Tuk, Raya's best friend and pet pill bug. So, of all the animal sidekicks in Disney princess movies, a pill bug is probably the most unique. So, it has a pretty great cast, minus one 
pretty talentless exception, but hey, nothing can be perfect. And again, that is just my opinion. She clearly has an audience. Clearly, some people enjoy her. So, all the power to her. And actually researching movies to talk about with actors I don't enjoy in them actually has me thinking about just what are the bad movies out there. And I do always want to be providing people with good content to watch, but there's just so much content out there that looks just terrible. Which is why I've decided to introduce a new segment to the podcast, and that will be the Flop Report. And that will be where I take a look at movies that just look terrible and look like they're just set up to flop so stick around till the next segment i'll be diving into that then but as far as this segment and raya and the last dragon movie literally looks great and by all reports is a quality film so once again it'll be released march 5th in select theaters and to those with disney plus premium access so be sure to check it out So, I hope everyone listening has enjoyed the family-friendly movies we've covered. I know that not everyone listening has kids or will be interested in the movies that I talked about, but I do want to make sure that I'm bringing a diverse set of content to this podcast and covering movies that honestly just can appeal to different demographics and could resonate with different types of audiences. But for those who are craving a bit more mature content, we will definitely be getting into that with the film Crisis in our next segment. So be sure to stick around for that. In addition to me introducing a new feature called The Flop Report, where I take a look at a movie that just looks completely awful and boggles the mind as to how it got greenlit. So if you want to hear me sarcastically slam a Netflix original, be sure to stick around for that. And definitely stick around till the end of the show and our last segment where we will be diving into the Golden Globe Awards, which at the time of recording this podcast happened the previous Sunday. So we will be diving into the winners and losers and giving our thoughts on the ceremony as a whole. So be sure to stick around. We will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. to the GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I just finished talking about Raya and the Last Dragon, the newest offering from Disney Animation Studios. The film looks absolutely stunning, so especially if you have kids or are just a fan of good animation, be sure to check it out. And before I get into the third feature I'm going to talk about today, which is the film Crisis, I just wanted to take a moment to... Just spend a little time taking a look at films that really are not that compelling and give my advice on some films that should be avoided. Which brings me to the newest segment on this podcast, The Flop Report. Again, I want to be providing people with quality movies to check out, movies that can appeal to different demographics, that will at the very least provide people with some entertainment value. But in doing research for this podcast and looking up movies that I think would be interesting for people and would be interesting to talk about. I just come across so many terrible looking movies. And for me, it's always been a goal of me to be part of making a movie and having a movie made. There are just some movies I see and I'm just 
personally offended that this made it through all the rigors of the film industry, got greenlit by studio executives, and there were enough people who said, yes, this is a good idea to make into a movie, this is worth investing in, and this will entertain people. And again, I'm of the opinion that you should always see a film for yourself before forming an opinion on it, and everything I give you is just going to be my own opinion. But there are some films that I've seen, whether it's the premise, the people in it, or a combination of the two of those things that just make me question how films like this are being made, and who are the people that have decision-making power that end up producing these films. And the film I want to start with, I'll be fair, it's targeted towards families, so films like that generally have hokey premises to begin with, and I don't mean to just dump on a film that isn't even meant to be taken seriously in the first place. But there's a movie called Yes Day coming out, which is essentially just the Jim Carrey movie Yes Man, but made for families. And to give a quick rundown of the story, main characters Allison and Carlos feel like they're always saying no to their children and co-workers. So they decide to give their kids a yes day, where they will say yes to everything. So it is the exact same plot of the movie Yes Man, and this movie is based off a children's book by Amy Krauss Rosenthal, so it's not like they set out to steal that plot, but the book itself came out a year after the Jim Carrey movie, so I'll let you connect the dots on that one. So it loses points on originality. And again, not to be an old man yelling at a cloud for a movie that isn't even geared towards people of my age, and is meant to have a goofy premise to appeal to children, just... Like, who's thinking kids are going to be drawn to something like this? I mean, just in sheer competition of children's programming when it comes to movies, the ones I talked about, Spongebob, Sponge on the Run, Raya and the Last Dragon, I can see why those would appeal to children, and why kids would be drawn to movies like that. But even if you take a step outside the realm of movies, and go into the other forms of children's entertainment there is out there, all the mobile games kids have access to, all the console games kids have access to, and how things like that are becoming the most popular form of children's entertainment. But no, kids are going to be drawn to Jennifer Garner having to say yes to everything her fictional kids say. A story like that is what the children's entertainment market is looking for. So, the family comedy Yes Day is the first feature on the Flop Report. For anyone interested, it will debut on Netflix March 12th. Watch at your own risk. So, to make a complete 180 and pivot away from the family-friendly content I've been talking about today, I want to talk about a film that really just seems like it's very compelling, has a lot of great actors in it, and that is the film Crisis. And again, I could not be deviating from the other segments in this podcast more abruptly, so if you came for the family-friendly content, now may be your time to exit. This film is rated R, it stars someone who has been mired in controversy over the past few months, and it has a very adult theme. It is about the film Crisis takes a look at the opioid epidemic from a few different perspectives, so this is going to be a rather mature topic. Again, the film is rated R, so viewer discretion is advised, or I guess listener discretion is advised. But this is a film with an all-star cast, a very compelling message, and it looks like it was incredibly well made. It has been released in theaters. It made its debut February 26th, and it is having a video-on-demand release March 5th. So there are multiple ways to see this movie if you are interested. And to just clear up a bit of controversy right off the bat, this film does star Army Hammer. Not going to get into the stuff that's been said about him and speculated over the past few months. If you are interested, check it out. It's pretty weird. But he is the lead in the film, so I'm not going to pretend like he doesn't exist. So I will be talking about him in the moments that call for it. Additionally in the cast is Gary Oldman, who is without a doubt one of the most underrated actors of his generation. Glad he finally received an Academy Award in 2018 for The Darkest Hour. He brings his absolute all to every role that he inhabits, and Crisis should be no exception. And the third main lead in this film is Evangeline Lilly. Surprised I was able to pronounce that right, because I've always had trouble pronouncing her name. And most people know her from the show Lost, where she played Kate. But these are the three main characters, and the movie follows their stories. Army Hammer's character plays a supplier, 
who is abusing the easy access to opioids. Evangeline Lilly's character plays an architect who is recovering from an addiction. And Gary Oldman's character plays a professor who is also employed by a pharmaceutical company that claims to be looking to make a non-addictive painkiller. And he has revelations about how far that rabbit hole really goes. Other main cast members include Greg Kinnear, Michelle Rodriguez from the Fast and Furious franchise, Luke Evans, and Lily Rose Depp, who is the daughter of Johnny Depp. So it has a pretty terrific cast, and the story tackles a fairly compelling issue that has definitely been in the news and has been an issue in this country as a whole. And the director of this film is relatively unknown, Nicholas Jarecki, who prior to this is probably best known for his work on documentaries such as The Outsider and the 2008 documentary about Mike Tyson, titled Tyson. But this will only be the second feature film that he's directed, so it will be interesting to see an inexperienced director taking on a subject matter that has so many layers to it, is complex, where he is dealing with incredibly sensitive material. But his lack of experience aside, this is a film that he is very personally connected to. Not only is he the director, but he doubles as the writer, having written the screenplay for it. And in an interview with Screen Rant, he talks about how he lost people in his life to the opioid epidemic. People that got hooked on painkillers and were not able to deal with their addiction to the point where it cost them their life. And this not only inspired him to write the film Crisis, but it inspired him to take a closer look at the issue where he uncovered facts like 15 to 20 percent of people that end up taking painkillers will develop a dependency and an addiction to them. And addiction is a very complex issue. There's no simple answer as to why someone becomes addicted, but the thought of something being as high as pretty much one in five people who will take a substance will develop a dependency on it is pretty scary to think about. And that's why a film like Crisis has such an important message, and the idea that he had of telling it from multiple perspectives, with one character who's really trying to feed the beast and distribute as much of the drug as he can, another character is dealing with coming back from an addiction, and another character essentially being in the trenches finding out the medical science behind it, and being involved with the issue at that level is pretty crazy. And now we have more information on drugs like Oxycontin and other types of painkillers. Back then, 15 years ago, when he first got the idea to make this film and he lost people in his life to their drug addiction, there wasn't as much information out there. And I remember only later in my high school career would they actually educate us on different types of painkillers because they realized that so many people were developing these dependencies and addictions through high school sport when they would have major injuries like a torn ACL where you're in excruciating pain. And one of the only things that can help you cope with it is a painkiller. And again, some people can take painkillers and not have an issue with them. I was prescribed them when I had my wisdom teeth out, and I took what I needed to deal with the pain. The leftover pills got tossed. And it's just strange to me to think that the statistics on me developing a dependency or an addiction to a substance like painkillers is much higher and much more of a risk. Now, I was fortunate I didn't experience anything close to that, but there are people that aren't as fortunate, and that is what the film Crisis is trying to shed light on. And it's commendable that they are trying to spread this message. Again, the director, Nicholas Jarecki, this film is very near and dear to his heart. It's a very personal subject matter, so it was very important for him to have this film made. But Gary Oldman, who has an executive producer credit on this film as well, when he met Nicholas and started talking to him about projects he had in the works, said that this one is something that needs to be made and put out there right away. So he jumped on board as an actor, said, use my name, use my influence, use whatever you have to, tell people I'm attached to the project in order to draw other funding, other actors into it. This was something that he saw the story that was being told and knew that it needed to be put out there for audiences to see. And again, this is an issue that is incredibly difficult to deal with, especially when It's in hard-hitting news reports, whereas if you put it in a narrative film, it may be a little bit more easy to digest. And again, this is a very sensitive topic for a lot of people. It's a very sensitive issue. 
in the American consciousness as a whole. But the film doesn't shy away from delving into that controversy. Because while all films of this nature are meant to entertain, this film is also trying to educate people, because there is a lot of misinformation about painkillers and the opioid crisis. And when it comes down to it, the way this crisis pretty much started was the fact that people didn't know what was happening. They didn't have all the information when they were taking a prescription. They weren't aware of the ancillary effects that painkillers would have on their individual constitution. And crisis gets into very heavy issues. There are characters that have terrible ends to their stories. There are a lot of elements in this story that seem unjust and unfair. But one of the main things that the director, Nicholas Jarecki, wanted to instill was a feeling of hope that this opioid epidemic is something that can be dealt with and can and is something that people can deal with. And the first step, in his opinion, is educating people to the dangers of opioids and shedding light on the darker aspects of this epidemic and the very real reality that this film is based on, where there are people that have underground distribution networks to people that started off getting a painkiller because they had surgery and now that their prescription has run out from a legitimate prescriber are turning to the street for it. How there are people that are blowing the whistle on big pharmaceutical companies that really are trying to suppress all the information because when it comes down to it the more pills that are prescribed the higher their profit margins are and that's what the goal of any business is. But the film Crisis takes a look at the true cost that big pharmaceutical companies really go through in order to make their profits. And this film tackles, without a doubt, an extremely controversial issue. But when it comes down to it, films like that that take a controversial topic and build a narrative around it are the ones that are the most compelling at the end of the day. Films that are all sunshine and rainbows ultimately don't resonate with audiences and they don't have staying power. Now, will a film like Crisis have staying power? Who knows? But it has great elements, a tremendous cast, and is built around a topic that will force audiences to think on a higher level, question things, and hopefully entertain them. So, once again, the film is Crisis. It was released in theaters February 26th, and is set for a home release via video on demand March 5th. So, if you like crime movies, if you're interested in the subject matter, definitely check it out. Well, that was a bit of heavy material after talking about two animated kids movies, one about a cartoon sponge, the other about a warrior princess going on a journey to find the last dragon. And we even squeezed in a terrible looking movie that ripped off the plot of Yes Man. So what better way to wrap it all up than to talk about a movie that covers the opioid epidemic? This is true range, people. And I do want to be bringing people content that appeals to different demographics. I don't want to be constantly talking about films from the same genre, being ultra repetitive, constantly be talking about the same type of film. I do want to mix it up and diversify what type of content I'm presenting to people. I hope that those listening to this podcast are like me and enjoy a wide range of different types of movies. And if you don't, listen anyway. What else do you have to do? But... I'm going to take a quick break, but be sure to stick around because coming up we are going to be reacting to the Golden Globe Awards, which at the time of recording happened this past Sunday. It was an interesting ceremony in terms of the winners, and it was an interesting ceremony in terms of ratings. It did not do well, and people did not tune in. So stick around, we'll be right back, and we'll be discussing the Golden Globe Awards. Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast.
Welcome back to the GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I just wrapped up talking about the movie Crisis, which takes a look at the opioid epidemic from multiple angles. And I also introduced a new segment known as the Flop Report, where I take a look at a movie that just, quite frankly, looks awful. The topic feature was the movie Yesterday, which will be available on Netflix March 4th, so watch at your own risk. And at this point in the show, I want to dive into the Golden Globes. At the time of recording, they happened this past Sunday. And again, super strange times call for super strange measures. Tina Fey and Amy Poehler hosted a show where all the participants were zooming in. Jason Sudeikis made headlines for accepting in a hoodie and being, let's call him a little silly. But all in all, what everyone came together for was accomplished, and that was to recognize great acting and filmmaking talents across the industry. And if you're like me, you are a big fan of the fact that there wasn't a stupid red carpet ceremony where people have to shamelessly plug their corporate sponsors that design their clothing. I honestly am someone who comes to award shows solely to see the winner, learn about some films I wasn't aware of or weren't on my radar going into it. The pomp and circumstance of the red carpet and how, oh, we have to look at what everybody's wearing does absolutely nothing for me. So if people are struggling to find silver linings in COVID times, that's one for me. But aside from this one, mainly just being about the awards, there were some upsets and some surprising winners this year. Again, I'm just going to focus on the film aspects of it, and I wanted to take a moment to start off with the Cecil B. DeMille Award, which is an award that recognizes outstanding contributions to the film industry. This year's recipient was Jane Fonda, and I'm a little too young to have really experienced her prime film career, but I, of course, know who she is, and I think she's very deserving of this award, not only what she has accomplished and lent to the film industry, but also because of all the contributions she's made in terms of her philanthropy and humanitarian work. She's taken up a lot of causes in her life, from the feminist movement, she advocates for Native American rights, she is constantly fighting for the environment, and to tell the truth, she probably could have had a much more lucrative acting career and film career if she wasn't so passionate about other causes. So she definitely deserves it in terms of what she's accomplished in her acting career, but just from her humanitarian work, very deserving of recognition here. And a fun piece of trivia for people that are interested, she is following in the footsteps of her father Henry Fonda, who won the award in 1980. Now moving on to the competitive categories, I'm going to start with the comedy side of things and then move on to the drama. The winner of Best Motion Picture for a musical or a comedy was Borat's subsequent movie film. And I consider that an upset for this category, just given that Hamilton didn't win. I've never seen Hamilton, musical or the Disney adaptation, but the level that people love to praise it, I thought it was a lock for this category. But props to Sacha Barrett Cohen and the rest of the cast of the film, not only for being able to win this award, but buck the trend of comedy sequels that are coming out years after the original, with the sequel just being terrible. And that was not the only award that Borat's subsequent movie film took home. Sasha Barra Cohen also took home the award for Best Actor in a Musical or Comedy Movie. And I'm glad he got recognition for that performance. I'm pretty sure he was nominated for an Oscar the first time around. And yes, the character of Borat is completely outrageous and outlandish, but... The level to which he just gets lost in that character, it requires a ridiculous amount of dedication, a willingness to do things that are completely unthinkable, but he went for it with a character that had absolutely no boundaries, and it's good to see him get recognition for it. And Borat's subsequent movie film was one award from sweeping all the categories they were nominated for, with Maria Baklavats coming up just short in the Best Actress category to Roseman Pike, who won for playing Marla Grayson in the film I Care A Lot. 
And for those of you looking for something to watch this weekend, definitely check this film out solely for her performance. The level of creepy she goes to, while also somewhat being a sympathetic character, is really something to see. And she was definitely deserving of this Golden Globe Award. I will move on to the Best Supporting Actor and Actress categories because they are mixed and not divided into the categories of comedy or drama. And not surprisingly, Daniel Kaluuya took home the award for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal of Fred Hampton in the film Judas and the Black Messiah. This is a film that is a bit choppy, given that it has to portray true events while also being entertainment. But every moment Daniel Kaluuya is on screen, he is a lightning rod of charisma, and it is worth seeing this film solely to see him portray this character. And he was very deserving of the award in a very hotly contested category, given that he was going up against people like Bill Murray, Jared Leto, Leslie Odom Jr., and Sasha Barra Cohen was also nominated for this award. So he beat out a lot of actors who were at the absolute top of their game at the roles that they were nominated for, and he was very deserving of it. Next up, we have the winner of Best Supporting Actor in a Motion Picture, which was Jodie Foster for her role in The Mauritanian. And she definitely deserved it for this role. She had to go through a lot of challenges, essentially playing a strong female character that was representing criminals responsible for recruiting people for the 9-11 attacks. And not to get too political, but the Middle Eastern culture definitely isn't progressive when it comes to how they view women in their society. So for Jodie Foster to be putting herself in the shoes of a person who is representing people that essentially look at her as a second-class human being seems like it would be incredibly challenging. And I think these awards should recognize people that take on the biggest challenges and do the best job of portraying complex characters on screen. She seems like she had one of the most difficult roles of the year. So this award was definitely well-deserved. And moving on to Best Lead Actor and Actress in a Drama. Winner of the Best Actress Award was Andrea Day for her performance in The United States vs. Billie Holiday as the titular character, where she had to inhabit the life of jazz singer Billie Holiday and portray her story to a new generation. This is a film I have yet to see, but clearly her performance was worthwhile, and it will be one I'll have to check out. And moving on to the final acting category is the winner for Best Actor in a Motion Picture for a Drama. The winner was Chadwick Boseman for his performance as Levi Green in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. He picked up the posthumous award, having passed away last August. And I just want to be clear, I'm not trying to disparage his performance in this film, but he could have been playing background actor number six in this film, and I think he would have won the award. I'm not making the claim that the award show is rigged in any way, or he was undeserving for this performance, but this is really just recognition of a great actor who did not get the chance to have the long and illustrious career he was clearly set on the path for. It was a very powerful, emotional moment seeing his wife accept the award on his behalf, and again, I have not seen Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, but knowing the level of commitment Chadwick Boseman brought to every single one of his roles, I can only imagine that he did the same in this one. And I think it's great that he was recognized for it and recognized for a great career that ended far too soon. While the legacy he leaves behind is a short one, it will be an enduring one. But to move on to the other winners, I want to get to the winner for Best Motion Picture for a Drama, and this is one of the ones I believe was one of the real upsets of the night, which is Nomadland, which is a film that was very under the radar, and it's centered around a character played by Frances McDermott, who uproots her life in order to travel around the American West, hence the title Nomadland, which was a real Dark Horse nomination, not only in this category, but for the other categories it was nominated for, notably Best Director, Chloe Zhao, who not only directed this film, but wrote it. And what makes her win all the more impressive is the fact that this is only her third directorial feature. And the fact that she was able to grab both the award for Best Director and Best Picture 
is pretty remarkable. So I personally am going to have to check out Nomadland, and I recommend it to anyone else who is looking for a new film to watch. Chloe Zhao did, however, miss out on completing the Triple Crown, as she lost in the category of Best Screenplay, which was won by Aaron Sorkin for his screenplay for the film The Trial of the Chicago 7, and he was also the director of that film. And this is the third time he has actually won the Golden Globe for Best Screenplay, having won previously for The Social Network and Steve Jobs. With this win, he ties Quentin Tarantino for most wins in this category. So congratulations to him for that. Moving on to the remaining categories, the Disney picture Soul cleaned up by snagging both the award for Best Original Score. So congratulations to John Batiste, Trent Reznor, and Atticus Ross for their work on that film. And Soul also took home the award for Best Animated Feature, which honestly at this point should just be changed to the Walt Disney Studios Award for Best Animated Feature, because since this award has been presented in 2006, Walt Disney Studios has had a hand in 11 out of the 15 winners. So, get it together, DreamWorks. And in the other musical category for Best Original Song, we have Lo C from the film Life Ahead, winning that category. Life Ahead is about a Holocaust survivor who is working as a streetwalker that provides childcare to the other women that do the same thing. So I can only imagine the song delivers a very poignant message. And in the final film category of the night was Best Foreign Language Film, which I just don't understand the winner of this one. It was Minaria, which I understand was performed in a foreign language, but it was produced in America. So it's kind of towing the line between being a foreign language film and being a domestic film. But I guess the story of a Korean family having to settle down in rural Arkansas was the most compelling plot out of all the foreign language films in this category. So all in all, it was a pretty interesting Golden Globe award ceremony, which served as the unofficial kickoff to major award season. And one thing I did want to talk about was how there is this push for diversity in Hollywood and fair representation, especially when it comes to the award shows. In terms of acting, three out of six of the major acting awards went to black actors, Soul, which was a film based around black animated characters, albeit, won Best Animated Picture. And Chloe Zhao not only won Best Director as a Chinese-born filmmaker, her film Nomadland won the award for Best Motion Picture in a Drama category. So as far as fair representation and equal opportunity goes, this award ceremony definitely was a step in the right direction to accomplishing that. But if you take a look at the show in terms of viewership, it was pretty much a disaster given that the ratings for this year's award ceremony is pretty much equal to a third of last year's ceremony. Now I'm sure the fact that this wasn't an actual in-person ceremony and there weren't many blockbusters nominated, not to mention the recipients and nominees were there via Zoom, but it just didn't draw the normal audience that it is used to. So again, just another hurdle thrown in front of the entertainment industry due to COVID-19. And I personally can't wait till this industry is back up and running the way it has traditionally and get back to the level of grandeur and gravitas events like this normally hold. But I am a fan of cutting down the red carpet and making that as short as possible. But nevertheless, despite all the wackiness and on-the-spot improvising that had to happen with the Golden Globe Awards this year, a lot of great films were recognized, a lot of great actors were rewarded for their hard work, and it will be interesting to see who is nominated for the Academy Awards, which again will be announced March 15th. So despite the general lack of interest in this year's Golden Globe Awards, I personally am very much interested to see who will be nominated for Academy Awards and am very much looking forward to seeing that ceremony take place. In the meantime, to all my fellow movie lovers out there who are struggling through this pretty dark period in terms of new releases coming out and quality releases coming out, there is light over the horizon. If you're listening to this in New York City, you are now able to go back to theaters starting March 5th at 25% capacity. So there are things to get excited about. 
I'm excited about everyone who chooses to listen to this podcast. I know that we are in an age of unprecedented media saturation, and you have a whole ton of options in terms of what to listen to. So again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for listening to the GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask you to please remember to subscribe to the show and write a review if you liked it. That really helps us a lot. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, which is GSMC underscore movies, and Instagram. I've been your host, Rich McDonough. Thank you, and I will see you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to movies music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program